Michael's been up to some amazing things. Oh, <laughs> hey, Michael, how are you doing? Speak of Michael, and he <laughs> shall appear. I'm good, Mark. How are you doing? Uh, not too bad. I got to say, I can't complain, really. Um, I we got three viewers already, so I mean that's a pretty good start. And uh, I yeah. figure I'd better explain what went wrong slash right here. Um, that like why right, if you happen to be on Instagram at the time and thought, ah, oh, I'm really bored. I'm going to watch this interview. Um, uh, what, what happened was I had it all set up on, uh, on restream and being a, a complete turd, I, I, I clicked the wrong button. So I, I started, I was about to chat and set it up with you, uh, Michael, but then, um, I, I was messing around. I was experimenting. I like to experiment, right? So I was experimenting with the background thing, see what would happen, see if it would come up live while people were waiting because I knew we were going to be a little bit delayed. And um, so I, I set that up and, and then I clicked end, which meant end the interview. And once you've ended it, you can't get back into it. It's, it's done. It's done. So now, yeah. so now that link that I sent out to everyone is basically going to be a six second video of some nice colorful background with some music and that's it. And, and nothing else happens. But, Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I'll be able to download this and put this, upload this in its place. So um, anyway, that's my, that's my explanation. Try to make it as brief as possible. So we've gone guerrilla style on Instagram now. Uh, to, yeah. uh, so like you say, you like that style and that's good for me. I, mean, I do like to have things set up all nicely and ready to go, but we're going to, let's, let's do it a different way. Okay, so yeah. Michael Masurkovich, is that how you pronounce your name, Masurkovich? That is actually actually excellent. Yeah, Masurkovich. Great. There are people. There are people in the old country who would say Masurkiewicz. Masurkiewicz. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Here in Canada, Masurkovich is right. Pretty standard. Right. Yeah, because I what often happens is I usually go a little bit too far and I'll pronounce it in the. Like the, the you know the original homeland way, and people are like, yeah. oh, that's a mm, that that's a weird way of pronouncing it. It's like because they only hear Canadians say Mazurkovich, you know, and yeah, pa 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 laugh, you know, just and, and random <laughs> desperate attempts to to get the pronunciation right. Anyway, it so is we, we, funny. We, we, it, it's pretty funny to me that you are so good with accents that you will say someone's last name like as if it was from their mother tongue and they'll be like, uh, no, I'm, I'm from Canada. It's just Missouri. <laughs> like... Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it is. That's how it is, Michael. So, um, what I figured we do is I, I'm going to ask, I'll ask you a few questions. Like I said, this is guerrilla style. So, you know, different questions are going to pop up at, at different times. Right. But, um, oh. I mean, we, we kind of, uh, I think we've been linked for probably like a few days now. You kind of popped up on my feed and then, um, and, and I was like, well, I don't, like sometimes I'm really prepared weeks ahead. Like, I, you know, for a long time I had like interviewees lined up, right? I'd, I'd like done all yeah, my homework, yeah. had all my ducks in a row. And uh, it's like, okay, these people are going to be interviewing and had it all ready to go. Whereas this, this way, it was like, it was like, I didn't have anyone for a while. I was busy working on other stuff, you know, stuff that, that makes money, not much money, but still like, like this doesn't pay, right? This is for fun. So, yeah. yeah. So it was like, okay, uh, does anybody want to be interviewed? So a couple of people, like two out of the thousand something people I know out of all those, it was you and someone who nominated a friend. That was it. And I'm like, Really? Does nobody know anybody interesting? That like you're just a little bit interested that I get interview, <laughs> and um, you, you were the only one that. Okay, to be fair, a lot of people probably didn't see that post, right? But um, because I think Facebook just completely freaking throttles anything I put out, so two people might see it. But uh, you, you know, you stepped up to the plate, and and here we are, and. Uh, and today was the first time, uh, I mean, you, you sent me your, your links and everything, the stuff that you've been working on, and, and I saw your music video, and that is freaking awesome. 
I, I love it. Um, Thank you. So, Thank you, Mark. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't, um, like I've said this before, I don't mince my words and I don't blow smoke up people's ass for no reason, right? I mean, there's nothing in it for me. So yeah. when I see something that I think is great, I'm going to say it. And um, so I, I do want to talk somewhat of, about the the music video and also about stuff that you're working on these days as well, right? And um, so before I do that, though, I'm going to do a guerrilla style thing and I'm going to see if I can switch to my uh, rear camera and see if I can actually... Uh, here we go. Uh, oh, see if I can play yeah. play a bit of the music video, right? So here it is. Yeah. So the music video um, is by uh, Borrowed Thoughts. That's the name of your your group, right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, Borrowed Thoughts, and the the title is Decompress. So I'm just going to play um, a few seconds of this, so people get an idea of, of what's going on. This is about half a minute in. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to stop it there. So and and what I'll do is I'll uh, like underneath this once we're done. I'll, I'll put the link to it as well, so people can watch the the entire thing. But um, nice. thank you, man. So you you wrote this song yourself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually um, I'll I'll launch into this story, Joseph. I'm glad. Thank you, Joseph and Carol. By the way, thank you guys. Uh, yeah. So I was um, I've been I've been getting really into meditating the last couple of years. And this song was basically, you know, I, I was between auditions. This is just pre-pandemic. I was between auditions. I was stressed about a bunch of things. I was near emotional breakdown. And then I just parked off of Rosedale Road and ran into the woods and sort of had an emotional breakdown, which was, which was fantastic. You know, I, people, there's a negative connotation to emotional breakdown. But what it really was was, you know, being forced to come to terms with a lot of my own feelings. And it was great, and I was crying, and I was releasing, and I started, you know, singing to myself through my tears like I was singing to my inner child to make them feel better. And the, the words that came out were, you know, I just, I need to de-stress, I need to decompress. And, and basically, that's how this song started. And then I uh, added some, some more lyrics to flesh it out a little bit, because it just kept going through my head. And like, I've written a lot of songs, but you know, that this was the song that was like, you know, I feel like this is something that, that might actually benefit people, you know, a lot of people need to decompress. So like, this this is the song that I want to actually invest in to, to make it into a product people can see. And I found a really good music producer, uh, Julian from Toronto, Julian Cassia, and he, uh, you know, helped me turn it into what it is now. But yeah, so it's 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 essentially an, an uh, a mental breakdown <laughs> turned into a turn to music, which which we really tried to do with the music video as well. Um, you know, it's it's essentially this this character from uh, from a web series that the 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 writer director of the web series allowed me to use for the music video, going through you know with his life flashing through his eyes until he finally completely breaks down and then gets pulled out of the metaphorical water by his higher self. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of a similar thing of like a, a meditative mental processing breakdown to music. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's yeah. a, 
it's a triumph. Like um, when I was watching it, it was like I, I was gripped. Right? It was like a story. You were telling a story. I mean, basically, most actors that are any good are storytellers. Right. So as a storyteller and also you're a musician and songwriter and so on, this is something that you do. Um, but it was, it gripped me because, uh, you say that you were going through this back in, what was it? January, 2020. Like, um, it was, it was the, it was the, the autumn before the pandemic. So it would have been like, uh, October, 2019 ish right Something like that right okay because for me um yeah for me it i had very similar it, it wasn't quite as dramatic as yours like i didn't run into the woods it, it was basically <laughs> i was in a job that um i didn't like <laughs> And, uh, but it, it, well, it, it wasn't so much that it wasn't the job that I didn't like. It was, it was more of a toxic situation. And, um, after two years of, uh, of that, um, like working with a person that is not a great person to be working with, um, after, after, <laughs> eight, after two years of that, it will slowly, slowly, unless you can do something radically, um, you know, to clear that out, then it's it's going to take its toll on you. So it did. It took its toll on me. And uh, in the end, it was like, OK, I, I'm just not going back to that. Forget, forget it. And um, so, yeah, it was around about the same time. And that was just pre-pandemic. And, um, and so it's like, I had no idea of, of what was coming obviously down the, down the road. But, but so yeah. I think this is why I, when I saw this, it's like, holy fuck. Yeah. I totally get this because there was that time that was the first time in my life ever where I was like, holy shit stuff is, this stuff is making me unwell. And, um, yeah, it, it, I, I, I was a mess and, um, and then when the pandemic came along and swept everything away, that was my moment of decompression. That was like, holy crap. It's just, it's yeah. like a tsunami had come in and washed everything away and all the people with it. And I was like still there on the coast going, I like the look of this beach. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's what started a lot off for me. So yeah, it, so it did, yeah. I, I did find a lot in that, but enough about me. <laughs> Let's talk about nice. you. Um, I, I think that makes sense. And I think, uh, you know, I think you and I are very lucky that we had our sort of moments of breakdown just before the pandemic. So that when the pandemic hit, it wasn't like, oh my God, what am I doing with my life? I'm so depressed. There's nothing going on. It was you know, oh, wow, I, ju I just found out that I have a lot of feelings that I really need to actually face up to and have a conversation with. Suddenly I have time. That's great. Sit down, feelings, grab some wine. We're going to be here for the next six months. <laughs> like, yeah. But Thank yeah, I, I feel that. And so when, when was it that you f like first started writing songs? Because you said you've, you've written a lot of songs. This is just one of, of many um yeah when did all this start off oh man that's such a great story so uh and, and the reason i say that is because when i was in grade three uh my 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 best friend rory mcgee his mother was just this very accepting woman and they would invite me over for dinner and i'd be telling them about you know this dream i had and then suddenly i'd be on a flying bicycle and it's you know and she 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 would tell the story later when I was old enough to, uh, to, to process it. She'd be like, yeah. And, and I, you know, I'd be sitting there and at some point I'd be like, at what point did we go from Michael's actual dream to this alternate fantasy world that he's now living in? Or did he actually have dreams this messed up? So I, I remember one time I, I went to their house and I had written a song about the monkeys from Mars who ate Mars bars. <laughs> and I, I, sat, I don't remember the song because it sounds like an inspired piece of uh, of commercial product for the the Mars Bars uh, company. 
Uh, and then, you know, grade four, I have a memory of like, we had this great teacher, Miss Jardine, who would give us like silent reading time. So she'd put on Pockle Bell's canon, everybody would find a spot and be writing in their journals. And, you know, and I would see the other kids journals later and it'd be like, I went here and this happened and this happened. And I would just crawl under a table and just write horrible, horrible music to like to the tune of the Barney song and then just cry because of how beautiful I felt it was. So like grade four <laughs> silent reading time, everyone just sitting around with their books or like writing in their journal and like eight year old Michael is crying under the table, sobbing silently as I pen these beautiful emotional verses. <laughs> that, was my, that was my childhood. But then, you know, later in life I would you know, in moments of great emotion, like typically with uh, with with uh, women I was interested in or having my heart broken by or whatever, I would I would put it into music. And now in uh, mental times of mental breakdown as well, just as a sort of natural <laughs> progression. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that makes perfect sense. I mean, you know, like it, it's a way of processing. Yeah, uh, exactly. So. What made you want to go into music like now? Like, what was it that? Um, because you're an actor as well, which we'll we'll talk a little yeah. bit more about later. But what was it that that made you decide to go for the the music side of things now? Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, I, I I love the creative process. I love creating, and I was definitely. Like, it's it's always been something that I've kind of been on the fence about. Like, a year ago, I or two years now or something, I, I took this song, Suicidal Fly, and I got a friend of mine to uh, film me playing it and put it on his YouTube channel. Um, you know, so so it was, it was sort of two things. One thing is that through film, I've, I've... I've been forced to realize that creation is not something I do for, for success. It's something that I do for me. It's something to, you know, to create things that I want to put out in the world and hopefully bring some benefit to someone who consumes it. So, you know, I spent a lot of my life being like, well, like I could try to make a song, but like, I'm not a musician. I want to be an actor. And I don't know if I want to like spend all that money on making it because it, you know, so it basically pigeon, pigeon holding yourself. Like, well, I'm not this, I'm more of that. Yeah. I shouldn't go down that road. Cause that's not me or, you know, cause that's oh. not what I consider myself to be. Yeah. And it's like, and it, you know, when I, when I said, told friends of mine, I was releasing a song. One of the res responses I got was, Oh, I thought you were an actor. Now you're a musician. Well, no, I'm, I'm, am I an actor? Am I a musician? I like being in movies. I like writing movies and I like singing and writing songs. So like, so, so part of, part of it was just like getting over that, that, Oh, that's not what I do thing. And being like, no, this is just something I want to create. But a, a big part of that was the song itself. Like this was, you know, they talk about gateway drugs. This is my gateway song. Uh, because this was the one that I was like, you know, this isn't about me or a girlfriend. This is about being stressed out and needing time to process feelings. That feels like something a lot of people go through. So maybe this is something that can bring people value. So that was, that. it was really the, the song was like, this song is the one that I'm going to put money into producing. Of course, now I've got the bug and I'm like, well, you know, maybe, maybe. You know, my producer, the guy who produced this song is like, so, Michael, any new songs? And I'm like, well, yeah, which, uh, I've got seven. None of them are ready. Which one do you want to try to cobble together into an actual piece? <laughs> Thank you, Joseph. But I, I, I'm going to say anyone, anyone can, anyone can do anything they put their mind to. It just, it takes a lot of effort yeah. and time and struggle and sometimes money uh, so it's, it's just coming to terms with the fact that if I have something that I want to create, I, you know, it's, it's a question of, do I want to create this? Am I willing to put in the time, struggle, sacrifice and energy and money to, to make it a real thing? Yeah. If so, then let's do it. Cool. If not, then okay. Maybe next time. Great. And, um, yeah. So what, what does your, how old is your, if I can ask, how old is your, your daughter? Uh, son. Son. Daniel. 
There you go. You see, I've done all my research. I knew it was a child yeah. of, of some description. Yeah, well, that's fair. I mean, that's, uh, you know, he's 14, and he's, uh, he's playing video games over in the next room. And, uh, yeah, it's a great individual. Um, I have, you know, so you just have the, the one teenager. Yeah, yeah. I've got, uh, we have four in this house. But actually, we have three, te oh. three teens and, and one about to be teen, who's very much a teen already. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. Three, three of them are our own, and uh, one is one that um, basically needed a place to stay. So, so he's staying with yeah. us for the foreseeable. Yeah, yeah. So I know, you know, you, I, you know how it is with teenagers. I know what you mean when you say, you know, he goes into his room, sits on his device all day. <laughs> um, so what does he? What does he think of uh, dad doing all this stuff, being a muso and an actor and all this? Uh, yeah, you know, I'll be honest. He's not super about it. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, I mean, the, like, I think he, uh, well, I mean, he, you know, he, he, he grew up hearing people in my life who love me very much say, Michael, like, maybe you should get a real job. Are you aware that there's a lot of financial stability in what you're trying to do? Mm -hmm. So he sort of inherited this mindset of like, well, dad, have you made any money this month from your arts? Uh, yeah. Well, dad, I need, I need a new computer. Can you afford it from your artistic pursuits? And, you know, and that's fair. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm really, really privileged to live in my parent at, in my parents' house. Uh, when I was 17, they allowed me to take over the basement. And then when I had a baby, he was living with us in this house and that just situation was just allowed to continue. And uh, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful because it means a lot less rent and that allows me to spend more of my time creating and less of my time trading time for money in what they call work so that I can live here. So like, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for all of that. But part of it is also, you know, if I try to give my child life advice, he can say, yeah, so uh, you're an adult, right? In your parents' basement, right? Making money, huh? How's your financial stability? You can, you can give me advice when you've, you know, moved out of the basement. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, so that's a funny dynamic. Um, <laughs> yeah. But the only reason I, I'm not living with my parents uh, in their basement is they're they're dead. You know, I mean, right. you got to leave eventually, or in inherit whatever they leave behind. Hopefully, um, I, that that didn't happen to me. Actually, that's not how it worked out for me. But um, uh, Fair. Yeah. so I mean, you mentioned success earlier on. Uh, you said about you know I, I do acting. Um, more for me rather than for success. But if you're getting out of it, what you want to get out of it, that is success, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I went through a phase where I would do terribly in auditions. I would show up late or not know a line or, or have done something wrong uh, or not have the right wardrobe or freak myself out of it. And, you know, and it took me a very long time to realize that, you know, I was putting so much pressure on myself to make money from acting and to book mm -hmm. paid roles that it, it then became a question of, you know, the very fabric of my self-worth, whether or not I was booking a role. And then yeah. it became terrifying to actually do a good job because, of course, if you do a good job, you know, it's now no longer in your control and they can reject you. They typically do because it's, it's about, you know, what the director's specific vision is. And maybe yeah. you look like their mother-in-law or maybe you don't, and maybe that's a good thing or a bad thing. You, you can't control. Once you've done everything right, you can no longer control the results of an audition. So I had to realize that I was deliberately sabotaging myself almost every paid audition so that I could go into my brain and say, well, you know, that wasn't really my fault. It's because I was late or because of this or because of that or because of that. So that I, I wouldn't have to, deal with the rejection of sometimes you do an amazing job and it just doesn't happen to be what they want. Uh, mm -hmm. 
So yeah, so ultimately to be able to continue trying to make acting work in my life, I have had to kind of let go of the pressure I've been putting on myself to succeed or to be something or to make money and, and you know, let go of that and tell myself that I'm worthwhile just for being who I am and not because of success and then just allow myself to want to create, mm -hmm. to want to audition for commercials because sometimes commercials are really funny and auditioning is, it can be really fun. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the thing so is, that, been, that's the other yeah. thing that you, you touch on about, um, you know, success in work, uh, people asking you, oh, um, well, have you got a real job? You know, are you uh, bringing in the money? It's like, well, the thing is, you can have a real job. You can be bringing in loads of money. But the thing is, like, if you're doing that year in, year out, and you are not having fun, you're fucked. Like, basically, if your money maker is not also your fun maker, after a while, that's going to build up, and you're gonna you're gonna hate yourself. Like, you, so the thing is, what you're doing, you're you're finding your way through doing what you love doing and doing it well, having fun, and then like after like. You know, you've like you said, you've invested a lot in this music video, um, and also there's a, I, I'm going to show a clip from the um, the trailer, the teaser for the movie that you uh, that you're in. Um, yeah, that over time will accumulate, and and the joy and the passion that you have and the talent will come through and be seen, and it is a it is a case of uh, especially with with acting it is about becoming comfortable with the constant rejection like every time and expecting it um and i think it was brian cranston who came out with um an amazing uh thing i i, I can't do it justice I, i'm going to completely misquote it right so i'm going to just paraphrase what he said and he, he said something like um as soon as you realize that you're going into an audition um, to show them your version of that character and then being okay that if they want it, they'll take it. If they don't, they won't. And that's it. And then walking out of there and not expecting, not like constantly hoping, oh my God, are they going to call back? Am I going to hear back for that? Oh my God. If oh, I didn't hear anything back, I must have been terrible. I thought it was good. Well, you are good, but you, like you said, you mentioned it earlier, your very words were something like you weren't the exact way that that uh, casting director, his vision or her vision of that. So um, that's not the same as, you know, like basically people going through some fruit at the supermarket and going, that's rotten, that's rotten. It's like they're going, oh, no, that's not quite the right color of apple that I want. I'll put that aside. Well, that one, it was a little bit, it's not quite ripe yet. It's the same, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a stupid analogy. I know, but I just came up with this on top of my head. And it's like, you have yeah, to, you have to kind of get used to that. That's part of the whole process. That's part of the whole game, if you like, is just realizing that that rejection isn't really rejection. It's just saying that, okay, you're not ready for this right now. But as yeah. you're doing it more and more, you're honing your craft. Like you're getting even better every time. Keeping that passion. That's the other thing is making sure that if it really is your passion that's driving you and this is really your thing, that's going to stay. So, yeah. you know, it is success. Yeah, sure. And when people ask you, oh, well, but what's your real job? Because, I mean, I know actors get asked this quite a lot like well okay yeah 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 you're an actor. what are you oh you're an actor yeah 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 what's your real job and then people will say well that is that is my real job um but you know okay i i'm a waiter uh, you know I, i'm a server at uh the pub down the road that allows me to do my real job whatever yeah. but totally totally and I, I like that i like that metaphor with a fruit it's almost like you know, it's almost like when, when you're an actor, 
you get the role, and then before you go into the audition, you take it, you go, okay, they, I, I perceive that as this kind of fruit, and then you build this fruit, but it's, it, you are that fruit, and then they, you put a whole basket of fruit in front of them, and then they go, oh, what do I feel like? Do I feel like a banana, an apple, an orange? And, you know, if you're an orange, and you're the best orange ever, you, you created the best orange yeah. for that role, and they want a banana, you still yeah. created a great orange. <laughs> like, yeah. but you're, you're, exactly. I, I've, got a, I've, I've got a good story of the reverse of that working out, though. One time, I went into an audition, and it was like this massive thing. They were seeing tons and tons of people. So, like, the, the way that they were choosing was just kind of like, oh, okay, we've seen uh, 10 people for this role that appears on camera for five seconds. Yeah, that one. You were good. Uh, so, you know, so I did a decent job. I, I wouldn't have been even on the table if I didn't do the work. But when I got into the, the audition, the, the, I actually, I had a mustache and glasses like these and hair kind of like this, but all floofy. And the guy, the director was sitting at the table and he looked up and he said, you look like my dad looked in the eighties. Huh? And then I booked that role because I looked like the director's dad had looked in the eighties. That was it. <laughs> like, occasionally it does work in your favor. Like yeah. I was one of like 30 people who had all done a really good job of that thing. But I was the one who looked like his dad did in the 80s, so I got to be in a Kit Kat commercial. I don't know. And, and you would never have known, right? I mean, you couldn't have researched for something like that, you know? It's like... Oh, yeah. So Let's see, me. who's cast this? Uh, do they have any relatives that I looked like in the 80s? Like, yeah, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Impossible. But that's, that's what works. It's just 90 99% of the time, one of the other 40 people they are seeing is the one who looks like their dad from the 80s. That time it was me. It was great. <laughs> Not that you can't change their minds, but like, yeah, there's just a lot you can't control. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. The relinquish. That's, the, that's kind of like the real, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. It, it, it's not dichotomy, but like the... Uh, the I can't... What's the word the, I'm like? The, 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 real, the real, like... The double, it's like a double-edged sword, but I'm not quite getting it. But the weird thing is, like, when you're an actor, it's like, you're totally in control. Like, you're in control. You, you have to be controlling everything you're, you're saying. You're controlling your voice. You're controlling your accent. I mean, we'll come back to accent later, right? That's my thing. Yeah. Um, you're controlling yeah. the way you blink or don't blink you're controlling your body the way your body moves how does this character move who are you and you're moving so you're a complete control freak in a way right like you're controlling yeah. everything your every movement which a regular person a non-actor doesn't do and yet at the same time you're going in there and you you have no control over their decision so yeah it's kind of like it's like a cruel sort of, um, and, and this is where that word, what is the word I'm looking for here? Uh, cruel irony, maybe? Irony is a good one. That will fit. There you go. Thank you. Okay, I, yeah. I have to re-edit this and actually put in the word irony, and, and then it will all look great. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so, Amazing. <laughs> so you, have you got other songs coming up then? Uh, I, I just, I wanted to say one thing to, to that cruel irony piece. It's actually, it's really helped me in life because like, let's say I'm communicating with someone, right? I, I can control, it's like I can just say something and just blast it out there and then who knows. But I, but you know, acting has taught me two things. Number one is to control the intentions behind what I'm saying, you know, to, to stop and before just blasting it out to control, okay. I want to give them this. It's coming from this emotion. So like you would with an acting role on an audition, like, you know, you're deliberately controlling what I'm putting forward instead of just vomiting it out at them. But number two is also once you've put out your audition or the thing that you're saying to someone or your song or, or whatever, once it's out, you can no longer control it. It's now up to their interpretation. So like I, I, can, I can control the intention of what I say to this person, but as soon as I've said it, I now have to give up control because that is now entirely how they are going to interpret it and react to it. 
and that's not me. So if they, you know, if I if I control my intention saying something and putting it put it out there, and then they get upset, that's okay. But I can I can let go of that. I can that upset you. I'm sorry. Here's what I actually meant by it. But like, I can't control your reaction. That's you. So it's like controlling what you can and letting go of what you can't is surprisingly hard. Mm-hmm. That's a yeah. good, that's a really good point you make. That I mean, with any art, whether it's acting or sculpture, painting or whatever it is, whatever your art is, it is always open to interpretation. Like, you know, if you did a sculpture of a banana, let me go back to the banana here. Like, and it yeah. looks it, it looks like a banana, right? But you created this. It's the size of a banana. Um, but then people are going to look at it and walk around it in this big white room and go, hmm, I think I can see what he's saying here. Um, it's a it's a yellow, it's a fruit like object the size of a banana. And yet it's not quite a banana. The, the very fact that this banana is here on the floor where you wouldn't usually see a banana, but a banana peel, the fact that the peel is containing um something inside that is probably not a banana i think it, what he's saying here is something about work ethic you know <laughs> that that is what will happen to your sculpture that is entitled banana right it, it's gonna uh, people are gonna interpret it in, in that way so you're you're absolutely right in fact that i think that will be my very first probably last sculpture will be banana <laughs> um, <laughs> but I might make it, I don't know, blue. Oh no, that would be, I'll probably get done for copyright because there is a blue banana in Toronto. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if, I don't know if people notice this. Every now and then I, 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 I put my finger on the screen. I've set up something on my phone, <laughs> which every couple of minutes says, Okay, you're still using Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is, right? LinkedIn. Yeah. And it's like, so we're going to turn it off in a bit, all right? And uh, just to, so that I can keep my focus on whatever I'm supposed to be working on that, that day. And, and I set yeah. it up to be on like Monday to Friday. Uh, and, and so it keeps coming up. It's like, we're going to turn this off. I'm like, fuck, hell no. <laughs> yeah. So that's just well, to explain what the hell I'm doing every few couple of minutes. Um, yeah, fair. So uh, before we got into this very deep discussion about uh, control, yes. uh, I just wanted to ask, before we go into your acting, um, like, are there any like songs coming up? Have you decided on one that you want to flesh out? You know? Yeah, I, so I know what my third song is going to be. Uh, and I just sent a bunch of like four prototype I haven't sent them yet but I'm just I'm just working on uh the four prototypes of the songs that could be the second song so it's like I know what the first one was it's the one that that actually made me put money into making a song I know what the third one is going to be and I'm hoping it'll like make some waves cuz it's about cunning linguists um <laughs> okay that's <laughs> you know yeah Hopefully make some waves. Uh-huh. And then I'm just trying to pick the, the in-between one. And I've got a lot of, like, whiny love ballads from, you know, every relationship I've ever been in. So I, I think the second song is going to be one of my whiny, sincere, vulnerable love ballads. I just haven't picked which one yet. Uh-huh. And, that's, and then and your is, ex-girlfriends is, will all say, well, that's a song you wrote about me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's definitely, uh, that's not uh, off of the table. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens. So, I mean, you know, the poor people who have dated me, like, I don't know what they were thinking, but, oh, well. Wow. They might be thinking the same thing, you know, like, yeah. what, you know, what would be Probably. thinking, dating me? But um, Oh, no, I hope not. <laughs> anyway. It's possible. Point is, yeah, it's... It, 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 it's Let's talk about acting now. I want to show yeah. this uh, clip here, uh, which is um, on the IMDb page. And uh, so I'll just play this and then talk about that a little bit. All right, here we go. Perfect. Um, let's see if I can turn this camera around. There we go. 
Do, do, do. Okay, so coming 2020. So is it already out or? <laughs> uh, so uh, this this movie, that was the teaser that we made with the footage from the first year we shot. Okay. And we thought we were going to shoot a movie in one winter. Uh, and then the snow melted. Uh, and we also, we had some, some cast uh, become unavailable. So we had to do some reshoots and we had... Yeah, you know, just issues Tuesday. So then we went into the second winter, which was last year, and we did more filming and we got more done. Uh, and then the snow melted again, and we also had another actor uh, swap out again. Uh, and then, um, then this this past winter, we, you know, that there were pandemics happening and and there were things, and we were like, ah. But then I, I reapplied for the Region of Waterloo Arts Fund for ten grand to go towards prosthetics so that we could do some really crazy stuff to my body, and we got the grant. And then I was like, all right, I guess we're I guess we're guess we're finishing this movie. So this past winter we just uh, worked tirelessly and filmed a lot and finished the the film. Uh, brought on a, a locked in the cellar to do makeup, which was which was fantastic. Uh, they they did a really great job. There's lots of blood. There's lots of gore. So that uh, that teaser is the teaser of the year one footage. There's another teaser where I just run around, uh, you know, tastefully but naked, uh, covered in blood, screaming in the woods. And that's, and that's part of the, the same teaser. movie. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the premise is basically, and this is uh, by Brian Locker. He also did a web series called Pirate Mike, where I play a depressed, failed actor with a cocaine addiction who dresses as a pirate for events. So that was a, a really fun character. So, yeah, uh, so he just he wrote this this film where I play a guy who takes my childhood friend, played by Manny Brar, you were correct, Joseph, who's a great guy, uh, takes my child, my best friend into the woods for a, a cross country ski and then just weird stuff starts happening and he gets pulled into this childhood trauma that he repressed uh, that happened in the woods that keeps looping him back into the same things and it plays with timelines and you see his, his father and what happened to his father and then that loops in and ultimately uh, my character just absolutely loses his mind and goes insane. Wow, so it's kind of amazing. Like, I want to, yeah. I love this, like that kind of stuff with whether it's about time travel or timelines and looping and all that kind of stuff. I'm crazy for that stuff. So, um, but it, and it looks <clears throat> hella scary. Um, but I, I want to see this. So, when are we likely to be able to watch it? I mean, is it up for distribution or what's happening with it? Uh, so we just we just wrapped it this past uh, this past March. So like literally a month ago, we we shot the final shots. So now we're working on the picture edit, which is mostly Brian and our uh, our our second lead editor and camera guy Tomo Nogi, amazing man. He's in Japan right now, and because of the lockdown, he can't get back. So we're we're trying to figure out like uh, getting the edit together, uh, but then. He and he and Brian and, and myself a little bit, but mostly those two are going to edit the movie itself, 
And then we need to get the sound cleaned up and the sound edited. And then we're going to work on the soundtrack. Uh, Brian and our script supervisor, Otis Morris, who also does music stuff, have this really cool idea of like, because the woods are making him crazy, the soundtrack like starts out with normal human music, you know, guitars and pianos and stuff. And then just gradually becomes a disturbing array of forest sounds as the soundtrack. So that's going to be really cool. And then hopefully in about eight months, so like winter of next year, we will have a finished product that we can put into festivals. And then hopefully it'll do well in those festivals and the distributor will see it in those festivals and go, oh yeah, I can, I can distribute this for you. Um, that's, that's the plan, you know? And, okay. it, and it's funny because you know, you put a, you put so much work into making the movie, like just getting the, getting it filmed and getting the sound and getting everything and capturing. And you need that because if you don't have that captured, you can't do anything. You know, you can't edit if you don't have footage to edit. But once you've done all that, then there's another year of like, well, depending on your budget, we don't have money, so it takes longer. Yeah. Uh, you know, then, then you have another whole set of work to turn what you captured into an actual product. And then you have another whole set of work to actually get that product out to distribution or to a place where people can watch it and get it into marketing and, and actually get people to watch it. So it's like, you know, there's making a movie and then there's turning all that footage into an actual movie. And then there's processing that and doing the color grading and the sound stuff and the soundtrack. And then there's getting it out there and getting people to see it. And then there's marketing it and selling it. Right. Right. So it's a lot of work. And this, this one, that's basically uh, that's independent movie making as opposed to, what, getting a Netflix deal or something? Yeah, I mean, the, the difference is that if you can get someone on board who either has money to pay for that stuff or has connections that are willing to, to do that stuff for them, they just, it's outsourced. So, right. like, if we if had gotten a Netflix deal first, then they would have said, oh, you need a second cameraman? Here's the money. Oh, you need some editing? Okay, we'll get that done. Oh, uh, oh, did the snow melt? Okay, we'll get you a snow machine. Here's that. Uh, okay, we need the picture edit. We'll get. We'll hire those three editors who we like to work with. Uh, we now need marketing. Okay, we'll put it on these channels, and they take care of all that. Mm -hmm. So the difference between indie film and non-indie film is that indie, you have to do it all yourself because you don't have the money to pay for someone else to do it. Yeah. Basically that's, that's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and hopefully you get to a point and a part, part of it is also like bringing people on board with momentum. So like the movie Snowblind, uh, over the three years we brought on the region of Waterloo for 10 grand, the makeup people to do great work and dozens of creators to help us out. Our actual budget is about 170 grand. But 150 grand of that is people's salaries that they didn't make us pay them, so they invested it into the film. So, you know, out of our, by the time post production is done, it's probably going to be a $200,000 movie. But most of that is just people working for free, and if we make money, we'll pay them later. Wow. But that's already, yeah. you know, that, that's already like building momentum of these people giving their time. And hopefully we'll get, you know, maybe we'll get to a point where a sound editor sees our stuff and is like, you know, this is really good. I will work for free and you can pay me later because I think this is going to make money. Right. Or yeah. maybe not. I'll have to, you know, get a commercial so that I can pay a sound editor or something like that. And then hopefully we get it into festivals and a distributor sees it and goes, you know, this could make money. I will do the marketing and selling and contacting you know, Netflix and, and this distributor and that horror website, I'll do that for you. But if not, then, you know, maybe that's what we'll be doing in a year from now is, is reaching out to every horror movie dispenser that we can find and querying them to say, Hey, here's our trailer. It's like, do you want to showcase this? So, so it's basically just like at a certain point, you hope that other people will say, Hey, you've got something good there. We'll take over. But until yeah. they do, you just keep doing it yourself. Keep plugging, keep doing the, the hard leg work. Um, and, and this is all the yeah. stuff that other people don't see. Like the only people, I mean, obviously other people that are involved in the same 
kind of thing, you know, in independent movies, yeah. of course, they know what it's all about. But the majority of people who end up watching it at some point, if you're lucky, like if it, it, it yeah. actually gets seen by people, yeah. like they're like, oh, yeah, that was, that was pretty good. And they have no idea of all those, like, well, in, in the case you're talking about, like, years, years dedicated yeah. to all of this work, doing it on your own. Um, yeah. And they, they'll never have an idea of that. But I guess that's part of, like, being able to control your own project, control your own passion as well. Um, totally, totally. It's also a lot of indie films, a lot of indie filmmakers – you know, we've got a lot of beautiful creative talent, but a lot of them will get to a certain point where, okay, I've done the creation, I've got the, I've, I've taken the footage, I've put it together, I've got a sound, I've created the movie, mm -hmm. and then they're like, well, I made a movie, who's going to sell it for me? And, you know, and then it dies, because yeah. no one's going to sell it for you. You have to be out there slinging it, querying it, sending your teasers unless you can get into the right festival and get lucky and a distributor sees it. But for the most part, like you, you got to keep hustling it yourself until someone else picks up the ball. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't in rugby, you don't get halfway down the field and go, all right, guys, I carried the ball. I'm pretty good at rugby. I'm just going to leave this here. Someone else, please. <laughs> you don't do that. You keep going until you find someone who is going to take the ball further. I love and, that and you use rugby as an uh, analogy. That is like, yeah. I think that is the least Canadian uh, possible <laughs> thing you could have chosen there. It's like, is there even a Canadian rugby team? I, I don't know, but it, it's like... Out of all the I've things, never played rugby. I, right, but out of all the sports that you could have chosen, like rugby, I thought that's kind of funny. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So as a kind of a, like, I, I don't have a, a segue for this at all, right? So this is kind of like a, a hairpin bend kind of like, you know, like a whiplash. You're going to get a whiplash from this one now. Um, I wanted to, I, I did allude to this earlier on in our conversation and said that we'd come back to it, which is about accents, right? And I know yeah. that in our like online conversation, you mentioned about uh, doing accents and that kind of thing. How do accents um, show themselves in, in your work? Like what kind of stuff have you done in accents or learning accents or any of that? Like, what's your involvement with that? Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, accents have been have been great for me. I uh, the biggest thing that I've gotten to do because of accents is uh, a local Hamilton-based web series called The Chronicles of Blood, which is basically about. Uh, it's a great premise. It's it's this uh, vampire sort of left over from the Holy Roman Empire up in Great Britain who starts coming across these tribes of Scotsmen and these these medieval British kings and then this vampire is sort of awoken and and it's it's the 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 Scottish versus the British who king dares to disturb the my slumber something like that <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, that's kind of the vampire guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so I, I, uh, I auditioned for, you know, a very minor role, uh, but I, I did it in this accent and, and the guy was like, oh, you've actually, uh, you can act and do a Scottish accent. You know what? Here, I'm going to give you this much better role. And, you can uh, walk and talk at the same time. Amazing. I, yeah. Well, yeah, so that was really fun. Although I do also, I have a Romanian mother, and the only union gig I've ever done, I was just a day player on a, a TV show or web series or something called Impulse. Fantastic show. It was about kids who develop powers of time travel. And I played this I angry love it Romanian. Already. I love time travel I, stuff. Yeah. I knew you would. I knew you would. <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, I went, I, I found out about the audition, and... I uh, I asked my mother to coach me on how to say these three Romanian lines uh, with the right accent. So then I went in and I did my usual acting thing where, you know, it's emotional and I'm taking direction and pivoting in the room. I did all the, the things usual, but with actually good Romanian. Now, ask me for anything outside of those phrases. 
I, it wouldn't have been great. But casting was like, oh, wow, this guy can uh, act and speak the line in Romanian. And I got a, a union gig out of it. So it was, it was amazing. Uh, so, yeah, so accents have definitely have, have really helped. I also um, I speak a bit of French. You know, my, my dad speaks only French to me at home, but it's Ontario French. Uh, oh, but one time I auditioned, yeah, yeah. But one time I auditioned for a pizza pizza commercial and there weren't a lot of lines so I, I took those lines and I listened to like Radio Quebec for like three days straight, just practicing this like one line over and over again until finally I could walk into the room and, you know, and, and act as the skill of acting while saying this line in French while sounding Quebecois. And I got to be in a pizza pizza commercial. Awesome. Now, I mean, Can you remember the, what like, was the line of interest? Uh, I know that I, I got to do the English version as well. And I know that the English version was, uh, so no dipping sauce. Um, <laughs> what, would that be in, uh, what would that be in French? I remember that dipping sauce is trompette. So trompette. I think it was like, uh, donc pas de trompette, something like that. And, and so, but, and, and what would that be? Can you do it in the accents? Like, like, can you do it in an Ontarian accent and like a Quebecois accent? Like, is there like a subtle difference between like saying the line in one and the other? Yeah, there definitely is. There definitely is. Well, can I? Can, uh, can, you, can you do it? I mean, I'm really. I. It's unfair. I'm putting you on the spot now, but I'm just. I'm fascinated. I yeah. want to know what the difference is. I'm just gonna go listen to Radio Quebec for three days and come back. Uh, no, I mean uh, the, the the Quebec Quebec French is faster, looser. They're cowboys shooting from the hip. The mouth is a little bit longer. So for an Ontario French, I would say "donc pas de trompette avec ça." Versus Quebec French, I would say "donc pas de trompette avec ça." It's, you know, it's, it's the same words, but faster, looser, and l sort of longer in the mouth. Right. That probably, if anyone, apologies to anyone actually from Quebec watching this. That probably wasn't amazing. I swear I took way more time to do that better <laughs> last time. Uh, it's better than I could do, that's for sure. Well, I mean, it's a different language. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny because most Quebec like in Quebec, they they really like Quebecois French because they've had to fight so hard to preserve their identity. So it is like unless if I go into an audition for a, a role that is being aired in Quebec, unless it's a very very small set of lines that I can take a week on Radio Quebec to like practice those lines, I know I'm probably not getting it because you know. The moment I slip up and add just a little bit too much Ontario, it did. Ah, that guy is from Ontario. We don't want Anglo no Ontario here, you know, no Anglos. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, I don't get a lot of Quebec roles, but when I do, they're great. Mm. Uh, but yeah, very much, very accent based. That's pr that That's and the Scottish one are probably the biggest ones. I almost got cast in a union podcast once, uh, and the guy was like, yeah, you know, it's like a Sherlock Holmes podcast. So we have all these different roles. And I just, I did like a bunch of different British and Scottish accents for him. Which, which Scottish, this, out of interest, which Scottish accents do you normally do? So I very much base my accents on a specific person and try to listen to them. So the one I'm doing right now is from uh, the, the, the fellow who plays... Peregrine Took in the Lord of the Rings movies, and he's got a really nice sort of a lighter Scottish lilt. So that's so, that's kind of a, a perhaps a, an Edinburgh, uh, possibly from around that part. So it's definitely Lowlands or somewhere near there. I'd imagine right. it's probably around Edinburgh, uh, a, a wee bit further south. Um, that would I'm make guessing. sense. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Uh, right. But, you know, so he's probably my favorite because it's nice and light. Mm -hmm. I do also like Shrek. Right. And, uh, you know, if Are I need something... A wee bit of west, like, over towards uh, Glasgow. Okay, is that where that's from? I think so, yeah. Uh, uh, I think it's a little bit more... Um, uh, it's, it's still lowland Scots, but I think it's right. uh, a wee bit more Glaswegian, possibly. Okay, I yeah. Think, from that's... what I remember, anyway. That makes sense. How, like, 
So, so I guess the lowland accents are a little bit lighter. How would you get into a nice highland? Well, you see, the thing is, it, it's not about like the lowlands accents being lighter because if you, it's more of a socioeconomic thing, right? So if you're middle class, you're more likely to sound like this, right? And um, but if you're from Glasgow and you're like more working class. And uh, yeah, you look at me, you bastard. You come in here, ask for a pizza, and I'll give you a Glaswegian smile, right? I'll smash this glass for you, I'll put it in your face, and you'll you no come back after you've been up uh, to a hospital, right? So that's okay. more of a like low down, like that, right? So, for example, I, I grew up with uh, my dad, right, who was from Glasgow, but his accent was really quite watered down because he'd lived in Birmingham for most of his life. And um, right. so it was when his relatives came, it launched more into that kind of thing, you know, and uh, I'd have to really listen carefully to understand what the fuck he was talking about. And then, <laughs> so that that's lowlands, that's like Scots, right? So that's the south part. Yeah. And um, there's borders as well, it's a wee bit different. But, um, but then the Highlands, okay, we're, we're forgetting Aberdeen because uh, I think you're doing if you're, if you're forgetting Aberdeen because that's another kind of uh, Scottish too. That's more of a, like, a, a, they call it Doric, right? And that, that's a, a very distinctive part of Doric is like the, the where everybody else would say, whether you're doing that or why are you here, it'd be, whether you're doing that or why are you here, like that. Like the real broad door huh. from Aberdeen, Aberdonian, and up here, like up towards Dundee, that's got some of that strange stuff going on there. But um, so cool. the Highlands, that's uh, yeah. more that's sing songy. That's what a lot of people will call quite light um, because there's uh, a lot of influences from the original language that was spoken there and still is spoken to some degree. Um, in the Highlands, which is, uh, of course, Scots Gaelic. And um, when I first heard somebody speaking in the Highland accent, I couldn't believe what I was listening to. It was so sing-songy. It's like, I want you to speak a wee bit more and keep going. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, yeah, up there, it's, it's such a different, such a different lilt. And so many other kind of features that um, have transferred directly from Gaelic, or Gaelic, as it's called up there, because Gaelic usually refers to Irish Gaelic. But um, sure. yeah, Scots Gaelic, like the like devoicing of certain things, um, like uh, instead of I don't know, badge, it'd be like batch, and and it becomes devoiced at the end, and all kinds of stuff there and the intonation is really different and like yeah it, it's beautiful like i the highlands for me that's like one of my soul places that's like my happy place up there it's mm -hmm. so beautiful and the sound of the people add to that because it's so different from like the lowland scots that you would normally hear in commercials and even on um out you know outlander yeah, yeah. I, I love that show but this is the weird thing that in Outlander most of the characters are from the Highlands right they speak um, Gaelic as their first language but right. they don't speak with the Highland accent and I don't understand right. why that is it's probably because they imagine it's going for an international market and people will think oh well they, they sounded like Indians or whatever they might associate the accent with and it it's so odd to me that they all sound like they're from, you know, somewhere like, uh, you know, Fife or something. And they're, they're, yeah. they're not Lowlanders, they're Highlanders. Anyway, that's it. Okay, that's my, that's my piece. You know, I've gone off on one. I, I saw, I saw uh, a couple years ago, the last, not the last, but the second last year that TIFF was actually allowed to happen, there was a, a film that, that premiered that was about... Uh, Robert the Bruce. I'm trying to remember what it was called, but it was, you know, it was about the whole like, like if Braveheart is this block of Scottish history, it was like right after that. Right. And and you know, and at one point they escaped to the Highlands, and you know, and these Highlanders were all just like bright red hair, super skinny, <laughs> and spoke with this lovely little lilt, you know. And yeah. and I had sort of gone in being like. 
oh, you know, the Highlanders, they're big and they talk like this, you know, they're all Sean Connery. <laughs> and, you know, and no, the Highlanders were these, you know, wild, artsy, slender, red-haired, lilting fairy people, and it was amazing. And I, that sounds like they actually did a much more realistic job of it. Uh, yeah, it, it sounds like it. I know that, um, I think it's the same movie, Robert the Bruce did get, um, like, some people were saying, oh, I don't know, the axe is not quite right for Robert the Bruce, and, and it's Maybe like, for well, the, guy himself. the yeah. thing is, like, okay, well, Robert the Bruce lived so long ago, you can't criticize, like, the accent, if, like, number one, if he was talking in English, right, um, you wouldn't be able to understand what he was saying because we're talking like several hundred years ago. People did not speak English the same back then, right? And would not yeah. have had we, the exact, the accents we have now did not exist back then. They were totally different. Number two, Robert the Bruce was from a class of um, like the gentry that would be speaking French most of the time. So how realistic do you want to get have him speaking in like uh, you know middle French, um, the uh, the French that he would have spoken at that time in Britain. Like, like where do you want to go with this? And this is what it comes down to. Like we come back, we're circling back to control now, artistic control. I mean, when it comes to like portraying something from that far back, you have to bring in the artistic license and say, okay, these are my artistic decisions he's going to have this accent, the Highlanders. And I think I'm answering my own question here with Outlander as well, because I know they have a great dialect coach on that. There's, uh, I can't remember the lady's name, but she's uh, well known. And and I'm sure that she made this decision, decision to go with the more lowland accents for a good reason. And um, yeah. it's like, yeah, you have to make those decisions to go, okay, this has got to be distributed. This has got to be seen by Americans and have them coming back for more. Um, and not by historians, right? So otherwise it's going to tank. So anyway. Yeah, that makes sense. I, uh, I wanted to talk about your, your story about, uh, uh, did you say it was your, your father who, 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 uh, grew up with, with a watered down accent cause he was living in Birmingham. Yeah. And... Yeah. It was, yeah, it was my dad. Um, yeah. who I, I was like, he, was from Glasgow. Like, um, his dad was from Glasgow. His dad was actually ended up in Glasgow. But so generations of Glaswegians, and he was the first one to move out of Scotland. Um, and he set up in Birmingham after the war. <clears throat> so he was there uh, and stayed there for the rest of his life. So his accent was, um, this is the thing, like adjusting your accent so that other people don't keep going, what? What, what what did he yeah. say? So you know, over time, his accent was—I mean, it was still Scottish. It was still from Lowland Scotland, but um, a lot of people would be like, "Where's he from? Is he from Ireland? Well, where's your dad from?" It's like, well, he's from Scotland, obviously. Like, because I guess because I knew, but and Scots yeah. would know he was from there as well, but would hear that his accent had all the edges had kind of been smoothed off. So yeah, that, yeah, it was him. Yeah, that uh, that just made me think of something in, in my uh, when I was in high school. I had this group of friends, these three guys who were from a combination of Afghanistan and Pakistan, and most of the and you know they had uh, they had spent most of their lives in Canada, their young lives. God, we were young back then, uh, but you know, but they still had a little bit of an accent. And then this great thing would happen, you know, like on the break in class or between classes where I'd be standing with, you know, the, the three of them and a discussion would come up that was like a little bit of an argument. And as they got more heated, their accents would just get thicker yeah. and thicker. And then suddenly there'd be an Urdu word just thrown in yeah. and then another one. And, and I, would just, I would just stand there and watch my three friends who I could usually communicate with gradually transition from fairly Canadian English to more and more accent until finally they were just having a conversation in Urdu and I'd just be standing and be like, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't even know how this happened. Like I used to understand what they were saying. And it was just, it was so funny though, because it's like, like you said, when your dad's relatives came over, it's like, 
it's like something about accents is is almost situational you know is almost absolutely. who's around you absolutely oh and always always there's the thing um when you take an act this is the thing it's like you know accents are they're such an integral part of someone's personality that you, they're not separable you you cannot take them out and this is the thing like i know people will come to me and say oh, you know and, and i do teach like workshops that are like okay we're going to do an australian accent or we're going to do a scottish accent we're gonna, and so just to kind of introduce people and just to kind of like get their you know get their tongues in gear and get them practicing stuff and point out features of that accent but the truth of it is that every individual that um is not has not lived their entire lives in one particular spot which is most people i would say these days right they've moved around a bit like especially middle class people they've they've gone from one town to another whatever and settled down in another place possibly those people like my accent for example my accent's all over the freaking place so if uh if i became i mean i, I won't but if i became like somebody who had a movie made about them, <laughs> then it would be like, imagine like for the actor to try and get that right. It would be crazy, crazy work. But it's like you, you touch yeah. on it. It's like, it's part of your personality. So, and it is situational because we, all of us don't have like this one accent. We have a, an accent continuum that will go from one end to the other, depending on who we're talking to. And uh, some yeah. people, and most of us don't have control over that. Like it, it just happens in our subconscious. Whereas with yeah. some people, like people on, um, I know, like I've chatted to people on like help, not helplines, like, you know, like um, when they, like whenever you want to get your dishwasher fixed, right? And you have to call right. the center. Uh, it's like, well, hi there. Um, so can you tell me what is wrong with your, with your dishwasher, sir? And it's like, uh, yeah, sure. And then after a while, I'd be like, can I ask you a question? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, sure. What's the problem? I'm like, no, where are you from? Like, uh, where's your accent from? And we'll get into this long discussion about the accent. And then like, oh, what? Oh, and another, uh, this was amazing. This one conversation, this woman was like, oh, and another thing we we'll say down there is that, for example, we won't say door, we'll say dough, close the dough. So talking about this freaking accent for ages, but it's like, and she was just basically also saying that it depends on who you're talking to because you'll go from your um one idiolect where it's like oh this is the, this is the face that i show when i'm talking to a room of people this is the yeah. idiot idiolect i use when i'm talking to my boss this is the idiolect i use when i'm talking to my family and and we subconsciously don't really think we're controlling it it just happens right it's a fascinating thing yeah totally totally like put me put me in front of a room of people and i just like i totally just i don't know i become this this, this douchey bro guy because like i have to you know yeah, what's up, like, dudes? <laughs> yeah well, let's go i guess yeah let's uh, let's, <laughs> let's look at this <laughs> but yeah no, you got I, a I, skateboard I, under one arm <laughs> yeah i was never cool enough to skateboard it's one of my lifelong regrets oh oh wow oh, yeah. yep. it was up dude yeah i, I see it I, I was never no i put me on a skateboard <laughs> i'll be off that skateboard and on the ground very quickly um nice. but yeah. i i i, I nice. do i do have a friend i some of some of my best friends are skateboarders you know i have you know and <laughs> Which is, I think, is very cool, even though he's in his 40s. And that's the thing these days. These young 40-year-olds are uh, going along, skating along the, the streets uh, with their hats on the wrong way around. Um, but, yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it's yeah. interesting how there's that, you know, like that kind of a switch. It's almost like a slider, you know, like sliding that switch from your one accent that is you to the other accent that is you and like that story you told me about the the guys from pakistan and afghanistan it, yeah it, it's amazing like so they're not just switching between accents they're switching between dialects 
and get into that yeah. point where it's like, yeah, fucking hell, you bunch of and get into that. And then eventually speak in <laughs> Urdu or, you know, uh, or Hindi. Well, yeah, there'd be Urdu up there in Pakistan. Definitely. It was, yeah, yeah. But yeah, and it, it was just fascinating to to watch the transition. Like they didn't, they didn't seem aware of it happening. No. It's just like the more excited they got, they're just the psh, 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 yeah. Psh, yeah. deeper and deeper. Yeah. And I find, I it, uh, sorry to interrupt, I was just going to say, like, as we're in Canada, I remember, like, okay, in Toronto, you hear different, in Toronto, you hear different languages every day. But maybe not, like, when you're stuck at home in lockdown in the pandemic, you probably don't hear as many. But, like, when you, on a normal day, when you go out, maybe on the TTC, and uh, you'll, you, uh, by the way, TTC, for anyone who's not from Toronto, that's the... You know, that's that's like our transport system, right? So you're sitting yeah. on the bus, whatever you hear, you can it's not unusual to hear like five different languages being spoken at the same time. And yeah. um so that's that's not unusual at all. But I mean, if you get someone that comes down from New Brunswick and then you I remember on the on the subway train here in Toronto, these kids must have come down from N B and they're chatting to each other in English and French, but they're code switching mid sentence which is like what the like in most places it would be like you know they might somebody might you know normally talk in english for a while like someone from quebec montreal they might sort of like be chatting in english and then oh they might switch switch to french for a, a sentence or two and the next paragraph maybe they're back to english not in new brunswick no it's like uh oh yeah so um I, I thought that peut-être uh, we uh, aller au l'église Toronto, and then afterwards we could go for something to eat, and then but, uh, what the fuck just happened there? You know, that's amazing. <laughs> boom, boom! Like the dial is going like this, like while the whole time they're talking, and, and I just remember sitting there, kind of like you know, trying not to kind of like stare at them yeah. i'm just this thing thinking this is amazing anyway it's just one of the amazing <laughs> things about canada i guess it is and you know and that makes me think actually of uh my french immersion class uh in grade seven eight nine ten you know in, in, in middle school and high school we developed this language where we figured out that if we spoke with french accents and just enough french words we could tip like the teacher would have to actually actively listen to hear that we were speaking English. So we developed a language that we called Franglais, which was, uh, you know, basically on the mostly in English, but with the yeah. occasional no on uh, Francais, like, and it, yeah. it was just this weird, like hybrid version. And it was hilarious because, you know, we'd be like muttering away to each other in this weird English French combination. And the teacher would be like, Oh, they're talking English. He just say, did he just say bathroom? Wait a sec. <laughs> That's not French at all. That's not French at all. <laughs> and we'd be like, oh, no, we've been caught. Uh, sell the mess, sell the mess, sell the mess. <laughs> yeah. It was great. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh. Exactly. Well, I, I used to teach in a, in a language school, and uh, we had this policy, which sounds very, like this poly sound, policy sounded so fascist, but the whole idea was that, you go to the school to learn English. You should be speaking in English the whole time you're in the school, right? And well, sure. I totally get the idea. But, you know, kids would find so many different ways around it. And sometimes I would kind of hint to them that it's like, well, you know, because it was so, it's easy if you're like a, an advanced level speaker of a language. And then, like, if you slip into your own language, you, you're doing it because you feel like it, right? Right. And um, and so the, the punishment for it would be that you get, we'd have this thing called a yellow card. I'm sure the school still has this. It's just that there's, <laughs> at the moment, there's like no one attending that school, right? Because there's not enough people coming in because of the whole lockdown thing. So it's all remote. So you'd have this thing called a yellow card where they, they you have to write their name down. And it meant that they they were basically shunned from class. So if they got like two of these yellow cards, they wouldn't be allowed to go into the class. Um, and if they got more, you accumulate them, you wouldn't be able to go into class for like, it could end up being a week, right? Uh, of you not going in and doing classes. 
So anyway, um, and, and if you're like, if you're like one of the like lower levels, that's really, that's tough. Cause you know, it's like, how do you have a conversation when you cannot like, you, you know, basically you've just got a few words that you can use and it's kind of, it's kind of cool. But, um, so I, I would say to them, like, you know, when you're on the phone to your, to your mom, right. You're going to be speaking in your own language. And we don't know that you're talking to the person next to you in your own language. Cause they could also be talking to their dad on their phone in their own language. We're none the wiser. So I, I found like a loophole for them. That really. is a fantastic thing for you to have done for these people, Mark. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, because it's kind of like a language fascism, which, I mean, I totally get it. It was, it was for marketing, right? The whole point was that, you know, people would come to the school because it's like, oh, I don't have to listen to other people speak my language, which will allow me to you know, progress yeah. more quickly. That's the idea anyway. But um, at the same time, like, you know, the yellow card shouldn't have been, you can't come. The yellow card should have been, oh, we caught you speaking your language. Now you have to say that in English in front of everybody. You know, it, should, it could have been a teaching moment, not an exclusionary thing. But anyway, I'm glad you found them a loophole. Yeah. And I, I will say it must be, you know, like it, it, it makes sense to me that, you're someone who does accents and you've taught English to people who don't speak English because that means you were right there hearing the full gamut of not just accents, but people trying to process English from their language. Yes. That must be really interesting. It, it, it's absolutely fascinating. It's thrilling. Um, I mean, on top of the added uh euphoria of actually being able to to teach people about how your language actually works and and how they can make use of it to communicate with other people from other backgrounds that don't speak their language on top of yeah. that there was the like as a, a you know a linguist at heart that ever since i was a, a child um having the access to people speaking English in the accents um, that were obviously influenced by their own language's phonetic inventory. Yeah, it was brilliant. It was amazing. It was like, you know, an ever flowing tap of people, uh, you know, and me soaking up these accents of like, uh, oh, Brazilians say, uh, uh, say it this way. Oh, Brazil, if you're from Brazil, then that is how like a certain intonation uh, will be said this way. So then you find out like, oh, how, you know, and then you go and check out like, what is the Brazilian phonetic inventory? What sounds do they have in that language? Uh, why do they say will instead of will? You know, why do they say, um, you know, uh, 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 thinky, uh, thinky, I think he, instead of think. You know, it's like, oh, they added a little, a little vowel on the end there. Why do they do that? So then you get to learn about like the phonotactics, which is like basically the way those words kind of fit together, like a morphological uh, type thing. And, and there's not just Brazil, like Brazilian Portuguese, but also like Japanese, which has a crazy kind of phonotactics of like, you're only allowed one consonant one vowel and if you're lucky if you're very good you can have uh, a nasal consonant after and that's it that's all you can have in a syllable and that is why macdonaldo uh, is the is the way you say mcdonald's because you've got to have macdonaldo six syllables for mcdonald's wow because of how japanese phonotactics like the the rules of building words the way it is in japanese and yeah so all of that yeah absolutely thanks for asking that question <laughs> absolutely fascinating to learn about I, I mean i can't speak these languages i might be able to say yes please thank you and that's about it in most languages but to to understand how they put words together what sounds they have to make the words and um, 
And my, my party trick was to write things in Korean because Korean is one of the only languages in the Far East. Okay, Vietnamese uses a, uses a form of the Roman alphabet, thanks to the French. But like in the Far East, like Korean is the only one that has an alphabet. And it, it's basically, it's weird the way they in, invented it. Like, oh, and that's the other thing. They have an alphabet that was invented. Like no other language has an alphabet that was invented. Like, langu like alphabets are usually evolved from earlier writing systems. The Koreans mm -hmm. were so tired of writing things in Chinese characters that, uh, I think it was Kim Sejong, this dude back in 1400s, their king back in those days, said, you know what, let's forget the, the whole Chinese thing. I'm going to um, put forward this idea that we'll have everybody being able to read and write and not have to learn like thousands of Chinese characters. We'll have this system, which of course they wouldn't have called an alphabet, but um, we have the system where like each symbol represents one sound and then we stick it together to make it look like characters that look like words. And so like when I realized this, like, I only found this out like when I was teaching Koreans and they're like, oh yeah, that's how you write it in Korean. And it's like, oh, it's an alphabet. Oh my God. So, and it's such a logical, like because it's invented, it's logic. Yeah. It, it's completely logical. Do you know like Korean writing, Hangul? It, it's amazing no, stuff. It sounds amazing. <laughs> it, it is. So what I used to do was, and this was so funny because just to see their faces, like at the beginning of a class, depending on what the class was, I would write something in Korean letters and, but it was in Eng it was English. So I would say, okay, oh yeah, I know Korean. And I'd write something like, uh, hello, hello, my name is Mark, right? In, in Korean letters. And so then they would, the Koreans oh. would, uh, a Korean person would like read it out and go, hello, my name is Mark. I'd be like, see? I can write in Korean. <laughs> and everyone's like, wow, teacher, where did you learn Korean? And then I'd have to fess up. That's like, That's I didn't amazing. write in Korean. I just wrote that in English using Korean letters. So yeah. the game was up. That's also that's a great teaching tool to teach people English if they're from Korea because you can you can use their alphabet to to put our words, well, right? Like this is this is the thing. It's like a lot of Korean uh, learners would believe that their alphabet was like, you know, the best thing since sliced bread or, you know, uh, canned kimchi. But um, I had to, like in pronunciation classes, explain to them that um, the Korean alphabet cannot, the Korean alphabet is perfectly designed for Korean. But because Korean doesn't have certain sounds in it that English does, you cannot represent English in it really because in Korean there is no dental fricatives, right? There's no th as in think. There's no th as in this, right? Um, there's no difference between, there's no phonemic difference between L and R. I mean, the, they do have L and R in Korean, but they don't think of them as being separate uh, phonemes, right? They're like allophones of the same phoneme. So, um, so I, it would kind of come as a warning that it's like, okay, you can kind of represent English words with Korean writing, but it's designed for Korean. Whereas yeah. uh, Eng English is represented by another foreign um, alphabet system that does not work very well for our language. So in pronunciation classes, I would introduce them to the IPA right? International Phonetic Alphabet, which as an actor, I'm sure you are very familiar with. I am not. I also, I, I also have never heard dental frictims, but that right. makes so much sense. Okay. Dental is your teeth okay. and friction. I can help right? you. I can help you. <laughs> so listen up. And, and this is, a, this is a, a message to all actors out there, right? Voice actors, stage actors, film actors, um, I know that a lot of people, when they go to drama class or drama school, university, whatever, 
they will get some lessons in phonetics. They'll get some lessons in the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet. But a lot of people become like a bit rusty with it and sort of see it as like an academic thing that's kind of scary or weird or I don't need that shit. Um, it, if you are learning accents, to have the International Phonetic Alphabet at your fingertips and to be able to use it is... A lifesaver because there is so much stuff out there that you can see like you can read accents you can see the features um that will be like it gets you 75 percent towards learning that accent and the rest is getting the intonation getting the vocal uh you know vocal um placement whatever um all, all the other stuff that like layers on top of that but um so what I'm going to say is I am going to be offering um, a, a workshop um, in uh, actually about two months ago. I said, yeah, next month, which would have been in March, but um, other things keep coming up. But by the summer, I am going to be uh, uh, doing a, a workshop. Um, so I, it is something that I am involved in designing right now, which kind of is based upon my stuff from pronunciation classes in the past yeah. and um and it's going to be invaluable for um any people learning an accent whether it is an anglo-based one or uh a f i don't know i don't like to use the word foreign but for a foreign language accent right so this yeah, is something yeah, yeah. that um i mean you're in my group already anyway you're in my talk like that facebook group so as soon as it's ready to go it's gonna be i'm gonna be posting it in there um and you know to, like basically the link to you know to to buy parts of that i was gonna say course but yeah. of course is when you like just watch videos and learn stuff but this is going to be more of a class so um yeah, yeah. i'm gonna be we should also that. probably say that like anybody that is watching this if you like to do accents there's this facebook group called talk like that and it's Mark's Facebook group and you should join because it's pretty cool. Yes. And I'm always looking for more people to come in and post things because there's, um, for a group that's full of actors, it's very quiet. And it's like, it's, it's basically, it's mostly me going, hey guys, look at this. Here's an interesting article about accents in such and such a place, right? What do you think? And everyone's like, yeah. yeah. And um, it's like, well, do you also have some, uh, you know, links that you could put up there? Let's let's share some interesting posts or ask a question like, why do people say things this way? Well, why do people in Scotland say that or what does this mean or how do i represent this sound in ipa or uh whatever as long as it has some kind of i, I think a lot of people are scared because i think a lot of people are like well i don't want to post something that people might think i'm stupid because i don't know this it's like how the fuck are you going to learn anything unless you ask a question, right? So my group basically is a place where you can ask what you think is a stupid question, and then I'll give you an answer that basically will make you realize you're not stupid at all. You just didn't learn it yet. Yeah. So that is what the whole group is for, right? It's for people to share stuff, ask questions, comment on stuff and talk about um you know things that are related to accents dialects anything right so yeah get in there guys get in and and, and add add whatever is on your mind as long as it is not like and also if it is something that is promoting you like for example michael could have the links that he sent to me about his song, uh, his acting stuff. People want to put stuff in there as well. That's fine. Um, I mean, obviously, it's not it's not appropriate to be like 
posting stuff like, hey, I'm selling uh, my bicycle. And uh, so anybody, you know, that kind of stuff, as long as it is uh, like, related in some way to acting, uh, and especially if it's to do with accents and voice, then definitely put it in there. Join and, and put uh. stuff in there. Thank you for mentioning it, Michael. <laughs> I would have forgotten yeah. it. But um, and, uh, and and I would never have met Michael if he hadn't joined it, right? I wouldn't have. Yeah. I, we wouldn't have known each other. So that's the other thing. It's a great place for people to meet other. Okay, I need to be careful how I say this. It is not a dating app, guys. It's like what. Yeah, yeah, that's the other thing. It's like, it's a great play. <laughs> it's gone. Michael's out. That's it. He, he has now okay. deleted his profile. So it is a great place to meet other people who are interested in the same kind of stuff, right? Accents and, and, that, and dialects and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, don't creep people. And this is not to Michael, right? I'm not saying Michael's a creeper, right? Let's get this straight. I just mean that I know that this kind of thing, here he goes, he's going creeping now. But um, I'm saying it because I know that this kind of shit does happen in other groups. That, yeah, that's, yeah. that's all I'm saying, right? So, uh, yeah, post stuff in there. Um, have a laugh. Learn some things as well. Serious as well as fun. Anyway, now Mark, thank before you. Before we go, yeah. I do want to... Uh, I do want to uh, before we go, I want to address Carol's question here. Why do Canadians say A after a sentence? Oh, that's a good one. That is yeah. a good one. Yes. Do you want to answer it? You're Canadian. I, I'm only, uh, I'm adopted Canadian. I am now Canadian, but I wasn't, I didn't grow up here. So that one should be for you. I'm going to guess. I don't actually know. My guess is that it's just, it's uh you know, it's it's sort of like Canada has this flavor that's like working class polite. You know, it's like we say please and thank you, but we still play hockey. So it is it is polite to check for someone's reaction after you say something like, oh, well, uh, you know, blah, 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 if you please, blah, 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 if, if that's all right with you. But, you know, but Canada's the working class version, so it's like, Oh yeah, that looks good, eh? Like it's mm -hmm. it's it's still a polite asking, you know, that looks yeah. good. Yeah. Eh? What do you think? And I'm and being polite. Abs like absolutely, class. that's a great that's a great answer. Absolutely. Um and the other thing is that it's not just Canadians that use that. Uh I don't think it's a retort. I'm I'm sure there's a technical linguistic term for it. Rejoinder? I think it's a rejoinder. I'm not sure. So don't quote me, but um, there are many, there are many versions. And I know British people that will sometimes say, oh, that's a good one, eh? Like they'll use a and people don't go, oh my God, are you Canadian? Like, so <laughs> it's not just Canadians that do it. Yeah, I'm not a Canadian, sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I, I know that, um, and I, the other thing is I know it, Canadians don't do it all the time. Um and I do find myself saying it. I mean, I've lived here long enough now that it's it's worn off on me that I will use it quite a bit. And even my kids who were uh, born here, well, two of them were born here, will point it out. It's like, oh, my God, you sound so Canadian. But, um, yeah, so it is, it's just a rejoinder that a lot of Canadians use sometimes. Americans like to uh, point it out to Canadians by saying, like, oh, that's what you Canadians do, right? You can always tell a Canadian because they say A after everything. It's like, well, you say huh after everything, right? And you carry guns everywhere. It's like, no, not everybody. Well, exactly. Not everybody and not all the time. So it... That's the thing, right? You can, it's like how a lot of people think that Canadians will say oot in a boot. It's like, no, no, that's Newcastle people. That's Geordies say oot in a boot. I was getting oot last night, right? That only there, right? But here it's more subtle. It's out, right? And this is the amazing thing about a Canadian accent. There is this, they have this like a split where it's like they split 
the the owl vowel um when like there's there's the owl version as in round and loud and there's the out ver version or o depending on where whereabouts in canada you're from and that's like before out and lout and it's amazing only in canada right so then what happens when a canadian is learning how to sound american they have to like cut off that part of their brain that makes them say oh a loud lout there's got to be a loud lout so a loud lout yeah yeah they're the same when they're being american and and all you know there's a lot more to it than that there's the whole lexical lexical sets as well by the way guys if you haven't seen my i i am also a songwriter and singer what yeah, yeah, not to not to your level, but I do have a song out that is called the Lexical Set Song. It's posted in the group. It's posted on my profile. It's I posted it everywhere, like a dog posts its urine. So look out! Oh, it's on my YouTube channel, right? So that you might. Oh no, you're not watching it from the YouTube channel because we're going live on Instagram. But if you go to J dot M p slash t l t y t right that will take you to my youtube channel and uh i think i posted the lexical set song on there it's a crazy insane song all about john wells's lexical set so it's a uh, obviously something i i care very much about <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, people people write music for their passions. Uh, for you, it's definitely the lexical set. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I've done one on lexical sets. I've done one on a different accent features throughout Britain, which uh, is another video I did, which is, it, it's more of like the weather. So I did the whole thing in the style of the BBC weatherman. And uh, so I have like, you know, the, actually I did it with a blue screen because on the other side of this is a green screen, right? So I did this... Um, the whole thing like as if it were talking about the weather throughout britain but it's actually talking about accents so check that one out as well anyway that's my plugging i've done enough plugging today um so i'll leave it at that yeah uh, yeah no that's true that's a lot of stuff that i personally am definitely going to check out because talking about accents in england as if you were a weather person sounds hilarious well i mean you know humor is in the eye of the beholder so um for me it was merely instructive and uh, i wanted to have fun doing it so I, I that's how that's why i decided to do it you know kind of meld the two because i used to work at the bbc um as a graphic designer mainly and um and so i thought well why not give a nod to that and kind of like do the whole thing in exactly the same style graphics and everything right and then like make it to do with what i do now which is uh yeah. accents because it, it is it's a uh, for me it's fascinating anyway um but um and and if you can make it crazy and insane as well as making sense you know then you can it, it just makes it more fun so um anyway so michael thank you so much for this conversation uh i had a great time talking to you and um uh and and it was a, a very open convo it started out very open and um in a very manly way talking about crying and breaking down and and uh and and losing it it's fantastic yeah. Yeah. Uh, because, and, the, and the health benefits to doing so, you know, it's very healthy to break down, cry and lose it. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, in my um, uh, my dad's generation, uh, that was something that you just that that was taboo. Like you just yes. not could not do. Right. So, uh, oh, my friend Karen Stolzno just uh, just joined. Um by the way, I do. I'm going to do a little bit of a plug for Karen. Uh, she, she's amazing because she is not just an author. She's a book author. Uh, she's a linguist, an actual bona fide linguist, um, and a podcaster. So she has a book out right now. Um, it's called "On the 
offense. I think I got that right. Um, and um, it it it's about offensive language. So it kind of ties in a little bit to what we were talking about, language and so on. So yeah, on yeah. the on the offense. Um it's it's out now on sale. Anybody else want to plug something that they're selling? Uh, <laughs> do it. What watch? Yeah. I, watch my music video, please. You're yeah, watch Michael's music video. I am going to put it in the comments. Um I know that yes, Instagram you. does not allow you to put links that are clickable, but um what I'll do is I'll put uh like a short URL down there so that it's nice and easy and quick for you to to type out and then go watch his video because it's it is really really awesome it's so cool um and it's beautiful as well and i gotta say like it shows that you invested quite a bit of money as well as love into the project you can tell from the quality of like cameras movement and everything um and some great acting in there not just from yourself but you've got oh, yeah. a lot of other people involved to to make it um the music video that it is which is great yeah so. i'm really lucky i'm really lucky with the the people that i've gotten to work with and also uh anything in the music video that's a flashback is actually from either a, a feature that i did called beyond the veil or the web series that i did called pirate mike and the the two directors of those projects were really kind in letting me use footage of me as someone else as flashbacks for my music video of me as this character. So that was cool. really cool. Yeah. yeah. So it's, and it's also, it's funny because, you know, I've just, I've done a lot of projects that are it because of how hard it is. Like we were talking about to actually get people to watch things. I've done a lot of projects that are like, I put a lot of effort into them and now they're just kind of there and, mm -hmm. and, you know, and it's hard to get people to actually watch them. Yeah, uh, I, oh my God. I hear you. You're, you're preaching to the converted here. So, yeah. um, this is the thing you put a lot of effort into it. And in your case, you put a lot of money into it as well. Right. So, whereas I'm, I'm a little bit tight that way. It's like, I don't want to, I don't want to spend money if I feel like I could do everything myself and then, like et do the editing and everything myself. And then, then it's like, it just takes a lot longer. It takes a lot of time. Right. Um, yeah. but you know, it, in the end it pays off, right? Like here, I'm hoping that more people will go and check out your music video after I put the link in because it, it needs to be watched. And, um, I don't, I don't tout shit stuff. Right. So you know that if you're gonna like, you know, I just plugged Karen's book because I know it's, it's brilliant. Um, yeah. I've, you know, I've, I've, I haven't read all of it, but I've definitely dipped into it and it's there for me. And I know I'm going to invest in a, in an e-reader. I don't have an e-reader, but I want to be able to give it the time it deserves and go out and sit in the sunshine. Cause it's, it's, summer is coming up here right i mean and we can't go anywhere we can't go to a restaurant or anything because ontario's in lockdown for at least another month so i want to get an e-reader and, and read it and the same like with your video this is something that people are going to get a lot of uh, enjoyment from uh from listening to the, the the lyrics and the music um if people have been through a similar thing that that we have um and they're gonna it's gonna speak to them and and also like so, the production values everything is there so yeah just you should go uh check it out so i'm really glad i we managed to yeah. connect and and yeah it yeah. was kind of a last minute thing but hey we got there right mark thank you so much for uh for having me this has been really really fun and it has been uh, i mean it's been really fun for me to tell you about my side but it's also been really fascinating to hear about you know, all of your accent and dialect knowledge and all of your experiences with that. That's really, really cool. Well, thank you. You're welcome. And thank you. <laughs> okay, Mike, stay in touch. And uh, I look forward to seeing more creative stuff. And, and when that film, uh, Snowblind, eventually gets distributed, I'll definitely be uh, turning up to see that for sure. 
Thank you, Mark. I will definitely, definitely keep you posted. Also, thank you to everybody who watched this, commented. Exactly. You, that, that, should, that, sh that should be what I say, but I'm just, uh, I've right. got bad manners, right? That's the thing. That's one thing about Canadians, right? That I found like coming from the UK, people, you know, this is a stereotype that Canadians have about the British is that, well, the British are so well mannered. It's like, uh, no. What happened was we kind of lost our manners over the past 50 or something years. You guys kept it. When I came to Canada, I, could, I couldn't believe my ears when you get on a bus, you know, you buy a ticket. Like you might say that like, you feel like, you know, oh, thank you. And they say, you're welcome. But what? The bus driver said, you're welcome. It, in Britain, you'd be lucky if you got, fuck off. It's like, excuse me, can you tell me where to get off at? Like, no, it's very different. So wow. Canadians, you guys are so polite, sometimes a little bit passive aggressive sometimes, but that's better. I think in a way that's better than what we are in the UK, which is just aggressive and, and often very rude, very, we're quite rude, aggressive people. So I stayed here. There you go. Nice. I'm, I'm glad that our politeness wooed you to stay in Canada. Absolutely. We're happy to have you. That and hot dogs on every corner uh, in Toronto. Street meat. Yeah. yeah. Street meat's a big reason why I'm here as well. <laughs> brought me to life. <laughs> okay, Michael. I guess we should go and do something a little bit more um, productive. So I'll, I'll speak to you soon, yeah? This has been great. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Bye.